Greetings from the Cosmos Foundation. This is Nahar Khan and it gives me enormous joy to welcome you all to our webinar under our ambassador lecture series on Bangladesh-Malaysia relations, prognosis for the future. We are deeply grateful to Her Excellency Ms. Hasna Mohammed Hashim, High Commissioner of Malaysia to Bangladesh for accepting our invitation to deliver the keynote today. I also bid a warm welcome to our distinguished panel of discussants. Mr. Farooq Subhan, former ambassador and distinguished fellow and board member of the Bangladesh Enterprise Institute. Ms. Yanita Mina, researcher, foreign policy and security studies program at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, Malaysia. Dr. Imtiaz Ahmed, director at Center for Genocide Studies and Professor of International Relations at University of Dhaka. Last but not the least, Dr. Rashid Al Mahmoud Titumir, Professor and Chairman, Department of Development Studies at University of Dhaka and Chairperson, the Unayon Oneshon. Today's event will focus on the ever-growing relationship between Bangladesh and one of its most important friends on the international stage through various forums, Malaysia. It is notable how Dhaka and Kuala Lumpur have remained truly all weather friends and allies for half a century. This is a good occasion to remind ourselves that this year marks 50 years of this friendship since Malaysia was among the first Muslim majority nation to recognize Bangladesh as a sovereign state in 1972. Through these five decades, there has always been genuine efforts and initiatives to enhance cooperation from both sides, be it through trade or investment, through labor mobility, or through capacity building and education. In a 2020 letter of congratulations to her counterpart, our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina called on Malaysia to work together with Bangladesh and take full advantage of the complementaries in our relations. This put the rebooting of Bangladesh-Malaysia relations firmly on the cards to build on what is an already strong foundation. A 2020 paper from ISAS, an institute with which our esteemed chair, Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chaudhry, was intimately associated, envisions this reboot through four core elements. Strategic confluence, the economic imperative, the humanitarian angle with the Rohingyas, and the prospects for maritime engagement and defense cooperation. When it comes to strategic confluence, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina in her letter noted that Bangladesh and Malaysia have in the past taken a common stance on cross-cutting issues in different regional and global forums. The underlying message calls for an upward bilateral trajectory in the 2020s, whereas Malaysia can act as Bangladesh's gateway to Southeast Asia and in particular to ASEAN, Bangladesh can also serve as Malaysia's gateway to South Asia. On the economic front, the time is truly ripe for Bangladesh and Malaysia to step up their engagement as both are striving to move up the economic ladder within this decade. It is to be noted that having hovered between two to three billion dollars for a few years, bilateral trade between Bangladesh and Malaysia dropped to 1.3 billion in 2020 due to the pandemic. Already in 2021, it crept back up above $2 billion and High Commissioner Hashim, who we look forward to hearing from today, has recently expressed that she hopes to see it touch the $3 billion mark in the next two years. Once that happens, I hope we can look forward to even more ambitious targets. I must also mention that among all of Myanmar's ASEAN partners, the role played by Malaysia when it comes to the issue of the Rohingya people has been the most commendable. We know a number of Rohingyas are hosted in Malaysia and we see your presence amongst the multitude stranded in the camps in Bangladesh, providing aid and other services. Bangladesh hopes that Malaysia would continue its political pressure on Myanmar to make them see the wisdom in creating a suitable environment in their northern Rakhine state for full repatriation of the community. Finally, with the growing focus on the blue economy, 
Now is an opportune moment for Taka and Putrajaya to explore maritime engagement as a new dimension of Bangladesh-Malaysia relations. For this, the obvious arena for maritime engagement to commence would be the Bay of Bengal, which has grown in importance as a critical maritime theater in the eastern part of the Indian Ocean. One exciting prospect is for the old Calcutta to Penang route to be revived through a new node in the Bay, perhaps in Chittagong, thus connecting the Bay of Bengal to the strategically important Malacca Straits. Clearly, we're not short of options when it comes to deepening ties between Bangladesh and Malaysia. And the cultural as well as the religious affinities we share allow us much room to maneuver. With that, I shall hand it over to our chair, Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Choudhury, president of Cosmos Foundation and our former foreign affairs advisor, and very much look forward to hearing from the highly distinguished panel we have gathered here today to enlighten us on the way forward. Dr. Choudhury, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nahar. Uh, thank you for those welcoming remarks and also for substantively uh, setting the tone for this uh, important Cosmos webinar on uh, Bangladesh-Malaysia relations. Uh, it's also my privilege to greet you, High Commissioner, uh, Hasna uh, Muhammad Hashim, mm -hmm. and all other distinguished panelists. And we are looking to a very, very interesting conversation this afternoon. Uh, I should be frightfully remiss, uh, High Commissioner, were I not to applaud your enthusiasm and drive that has marked all your efforts since you have presented your papers, and this despite the constraints of the pandemic. Now, the half century of diplomatic relations between our two countries have indeed widened and deepened the age-old ties between our two lands and peoples. Uh, many may be unaware that historically, that is till the 19th century, uh, the Bengal presidency of the British Raj extended to Penang in contemporary Malaysia. And there was a notable presence of Bengal merchants in Malacca dating back to uh, those times. Be that as it may, um, in the last five decades, our bilateral relationship has grown by leaps and bounds. Uh, the latest significant milestone was the signing of the MOU uh, on manpower on the 19 December 2021 in Kuala Lumpur. Of course, the MOU is an aspiration and the proof of the pudding will of course always be in the eating, but still I have absolutely no doubt that it will fulfill its goals and objectives. Now, this is a subject uh, very close to my heart. During my time in the KTK cabinet, expatriate manpower was also my other po portfolio apart from foreign affairs. And in 2008, I was in Kuala Lumpur to clear some issues on the manpower front, which was happily done. Given that Bangladesh in South Asia and Malaysia in Southeast Asia are two large Muslim majority communities with shared heritage, close friendly ties are unsurprising. This is also naturally reflected in our comments. I'm so pleased uh, to hear from what uh, Nahar has just said, how the trade numbers are inching forward, uh, uh, despite uh, almost to the pre-COVID figure. And I earnestly hope that eventually, you mentioned 3 billion Nahar, and I think the High Commissioner at one point has, had also mentioned a 4 billion figure. So I hope all these predictions uh, come to fruition. I believe though, the time has come for our two comparable economies to seriously reflect on the possibilities of a free trade agreement. Since I myself reside in Bukit Timah, Singapore, not so far from Johor, I'm able to keep myself uh, somewhat au courant with policy developments in Malaysia. Uh, we Bangladeshis are very pleased that Malaysia plans to open up a more to visitors as of the date that Ambassador Farooq Soban is planning his trip, which is the 1st of April. So Farooq Pai, you timed it very appropriately. While fully vaccinated uh, people will no longer require to be quarantined, I understand, there is still some significant paperwork work that we hope could be reduced. Also, the situation to ease the need to download uh, uh, Maise uh, Jatra tracking application 
can hopefully be eliminated soon. On the Rohingya issue, uh, Malaysia has held Bangladesh's hands and we are ever so grateful for that. I would absolutely commend the United States administration for declaring what has happened to the Rohingya community as genocide. This would have huge legal and technical implications. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has declared unequivocally that those who are responsible for the appalling acts of atrocity will have to answer for them. We applaud the resolute stance. Myanmar uh, has the, within quotes, responsibility to protect in line with the UN resolutions, its own people, including the Rohingyas. However, I'm afraid that the United States and the West may not, may have limited efficacy in going forward on this matter. Uh, in particular, with regard to this matter and certainly Myanmar crisis in general, this would have to be largely the regions and ASEAN's job or responsibility. It is our hope that within ASEAN, Malaysia will play a significant role, or rather continue to play the significant role uh, in the endeavors to resolve the Rohingya crisis once and for all. We look to Malaysia uh, uh, keeping up the issue on sharp focus in, uh, in, in all regional fora as well as ASEAN. I've extensively written on my progress for post-Ukraine world, New circumstances will, of course, shape a new world order. We are heading inexorably towards a multipolar, in my reckoning, a tripolar world, for starters, with the United States, China, and Russia as key protagonists. Middle powers like Bangladesh and Malaysia will need to work closely together to ensure the survival of a rule-based global community. This is particularly so in the aftermath of the double whammy that we have been hit with, which is the COVID and also the current crisis in Europe. I would now invite uh, you, High Commissioner, to the microphone. But let me just say that uh, the way we will proceed is uh, High Commissioner will have the floor for 30 minutes. Thereafter, we have this distinguished panel of discussions. Each will speak for 10 minutes. Uh, uh, my request to all would be to keep to the, to the time limits. And following the discussion's observations, I'll give the floor back to the High Commissioner for any responses or reactions that she might have to, to the points raised by, by the discussions. So with those few words, uh, High Commissioner, uh, it is my privilege to invite you to the microphone. Dr. Eftekhar uh, Chaudhary, uh, President of Cosmos uh, Foundations, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Selamat pagi, Assalamualaikum and good morning. Um, first and foremost, allow me to extend my appreciation to Cosmos Foundation for the invitation extended to me to speak at this ambassadorial lecture. And is this indeed an honour for me to talk about Bangladesh-Malaysia relation prognosis for the future. The intended outcome of this talk is a brief understanding of Malaysia's policies as the country progresses into a developed nation and also its uh, relation with Bangladesh. And after 64 years of independence and having several changes in the government political administration, Malaysia continues to pursue an independent, principled, and pragmatic foreign policy founded on the values of peace, humanity, justice, and equality. The overarching trust of its foreign policy has to safeguard Malaysia's sovereignty and national interests, as well as to contribute meaningfully towards a just and equitable community of nations through the conduct of effective diplomacy. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia is a multicultural, modern and progressive country. It is a resilient nation making steady progress towards embodying a prosperous, inclusive and sustainable vision. As laid out in the 12th Malaysia Plan, goals of growth and equality are on the list of top priorities for the next half decade. With a unique history and accordingly a unique set of consideration and values, Malaysia's national identity is very much informed by not just its strengths and moderation and tolerance, but also its geography and natural environment. As a trading nation that is dependent on maritime routes, 
post security and economic prosperity are irrevocably represent a critical function of the government. Foreign relations represent a critical function of our government. And maintaining stable and fruitful relations with key international partners, particularly those with which Malaysia has common strategic interests, constitute the primary task of Malaysia's foreign policy establishment. And as uh, rightly mentioned before, since 1967, the establishment of ASEAN has also been the cornerstone of Malaysia's foreign policy and the establishment of the ASEAN community in 2015 has significantly elevated Malaysia's approach and engagement at the regional level, concurrently strengthening both bilateral and multilateral aspects of Malaysia's engagement with the world will continue to be an important focus. The nation well-being is founded on the strong and friendly relations with other countries and its commitment to the multilateral system. Under the present leadership of Prime Minister Honorable Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob and Foreign Minister Honorable Datuk Sri Saifuddin Abdullah, Malaysia continues to promote a forward-looking and pragmatic foreign policy that facilitates trade, attracts foreign investment, as well as projects Malaysia as a stable and peaceful country. Malaysia is also an active member of the United Nations, and Malaysia is fully committed to multilateralism in advancing global peace, security, and prosperity. Malaysia's record in peacekeeping operations under the UN is a testimony of its dedication in carrying out the mandate of the international community in advancing global peace and security. At the UN and other international fora, Malaysia continues to actively participate in the deliberation and efforts towards finding solutions to various global issues. Malaysia has always believed in the principles of engagement and cooperation rather than isolationism and unilateral action. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia believes that growth and success must be shared to those in need. When prosperity is shared, sustainable growth can be achieved. Malaysia has shared its technical cooperation with other countries, including Bangladesh. This includes the Malaysian Technical Cooperation Program, NTCP, and through linkages such as the Langkawi International Dialogue. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as a country with a large Muslim majority, Malaysia also gives importance to the solidarity of the Ummah and the spirit of cooperation among the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC. Malaysia, as a developing nation, also makes it imperative for the country to engage actively Uh, including through the NAM, NAM LA movement, Commonwealth, G77, and also D8. Through this organization, Malaysia has sought to promote the SAS cooperation between the developing countries and the Muslim world. Malaysia also advocates prosperous neighbor policy to enhance economic relation and cooperation with its neighboring countries. In line with the objective of promoting and protecting Malaysia's interests abroad, a network of 110 diplomatic missions in 84 countries, including here in Dhaka, we already have been established and we were established uh, since 50 years ago. In responding to the complexity in global affairs and expanding international relations, Malaysia's conduct will continue to be by the principle of respect of independence sovereignty, territorial integrity, and non-interference in the affairs of uh, our engagement with the whole world. And we believe in uh, peaceful settlements of dispute, peaceful coexistence, and mutual benefit in relations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with this at the back of our minds, please allow me to elaborate further the bilateral relations between Malaysia and Bangladesh. As you uh, already have been aware and already uh, rightly mentioned before, diplomatic relations between Malaysia and Bangladesh were formally established on January 31, 1972. Indeed, Malaysia was among the first countries in the world that recognized Bangladesh as an independent and sovereign nation back in 1971. Since then, Malaysia and Bangladesh have been enjoying warm and friendly relations, including in the areas of trade and investment, education, culture, tourism, as well as technical assistance. There have been many high-level visits between both countries since the establishment of our diplomatic relations, with the latest being the head of government's visit in 2015 by the then Malaysia's sixth prime minister. These high-level visits have paved the way for greater cooperation between both countries in various sectors, 
Today, the close relation between Malaysia and Bangladesh is not just at intergovernmental level, but also people-to-people -people ties. Moreover, as far as trade is concerned, trade between both countries have also flourished over the years. Bangladesh is currently Malaysia's 30th largest trading partner and ranks second among South Asian nations. Bangladesh is also Malaysia's 20th largest export destination, signifying the growing importance of Bangladesh as a soaring economy. Trade between Malaysia and Bangladesh declined by 44.1%, valued at uh, 1.44 USD billion by the end of 2020. However, in uh, 2021, trade between Malaysia and Bangladesh was recorded around USD 2.57 billion, as mentioned before, an increase uh, from the previous year's record. And during this time, bilateral trade experienced a remarkable growth of 78.5%. According to Malaysia's Department of Statistics, Malaysia's export to Bangladesh was currently valued at USD 2.26 billion USD, while import from Bangladesh was USD 314 million, an increase by 83.2% and 50.6% respectively. Ready-made garments, plastic articles, machineries, petroleum and palm oil are the top trading goods between the two countries. In terms of investment, Malaysia continues to be one of the major investors in Bangladesh. Malaysia has investment in banking through ICB Islamic Bank, healthcare through KPJ Healthcare, education through Perdana College, and telecommunication through Robi Aziata and Edutco, which is respectively one of the largest mobile network operators and tower operators in this country. I am therefore optimistic that we will uh, surpass the USD 3 million mark in the next two years with the gradual opening of borders and the return to normalcy. As mentioned also before that, I believe in five years, the bilateral trade value between Malaysia and Bangladesh hopefully will achieve USD 4 billion. Moving forward, my ultimate aim is for the conclusion of a free trade agreement between the two countries so that the established trade relation between Malaysia and Bangladesh could even be stronger without unnecessary issues on trade barriers. In this context, I wish to reiterate that Malaysia has already concluded 16 FTAs since 1993, of which the latest was concluded during the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Real-life examples of positive effects of FTA could always be seen in Malaysia, of which it has contributed towards building Malaysia's economic sustainability. Malaysia has now become a destination of choice to many global multinational companies, making the country a hub for export by capitalizing on the existing bilateral or multilateral FTA. The negotiation for the proposed Malaysia-Bangladesh bilateral FTA has yet to begin though. But let therefore we hope that negotiation would start soonest for the good of our two brotherly uh, nations. As both countries celebrate 50 years of the establishment of the diplomatic relations, there are many areas and sectors that both our like-minded nations can work together on. Malaysia and Bangladesh should therefore capitalize on the existing strong relation between our two countries. Areas such as defense, aerospace, and food security are among such examples. Although the foreign workers sector has dominated the bilateral scene of Malaysia-Bangladesh relations, it is high time that we pivot our relations away from this. Yes, this particular area of collaboration is proven effective in bringing the people-to-people -people ties even closer and one of the most important economic variables here in Bangladesh. Yet it has to be handled very carefully as we have also seen how time and again this sector has brought extra ordinary high lucrative income to some and therefore could potentially be harmful to, good, to, do, to, do, uh, to the good relations between our two countries. Therefore, I'm certain that with this in mind, relation between Malaysia and Bangladesh will continue to grow as such. And I look forward to celebrating this auspicious milestone for the great two nations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic represents the greatest challenge to the whole world since the end of the Second World War. Two years since the emergence of the pandemic, international travel and global supply chains remain encumbered.
No country has escaped the profound and disruptive consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. For two years, Malaysia, like many other countries in the world, had taken unprecedented measures and action to protect its people from the virus and the economic damage that comes with it. Today, more than 4 million cases have been recorded, with more than 34 deaths reported in Malaysia. The damage done to the economy from the prolonged lockdowns affected many businesses and livelihoods bringing people to the age of their lifelong savings. The high number of cases, especially during the peak of the pandemic, had also strained the healthcare system of the country, resulting in many overcapacity hospitals. God willing, with effective planning and the active distribution of vaccine, the road to recovery is hopefully around the corner. Malaysia today has recorded a successful of at least 97.5% of fully vaccinated of its adult population. More than 91.5 of children between 12 to 17 years old and 36.4% of children between 5 to 11 years old are also fully vaccinated. This would mean that about 80% of the whole Malaysian population are fully vaccinated, with half of its entire population have been given booster dose. Businesses are gradually opening and schools have resumed. Interstate borders have opened and by April 1st, 2022, Malaysia's international borders will open, allowing international travellers to travel into Malaysia once again. As a member of a responsible international community, despite its limited inventory, Malaysia also made its fair contribution to vaccine globally, including to Bangladesh. On December 8, 2021, Malaysia contributed more than half a million AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine to Bangladesh, along with medical equipment in order to help Bangladesh achieve its vaccination target. This is indeed a show of support through a bilateral platform as a manifestation of the warm and cordial relations of the two brotherly uh, nations. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I may not be able to complete my remarks without touching on the very important Rohingya issue. On this issue of Rohingya, let me assure you that Malaysia remains one of the strongest supporters of Bangladesh in voicing the Rohingya issue in various multilateral fora. Every year at UNGA, Malaysia will participate, lead meetings, and issue official statements that concern the plight of the Rohingyas. Besides issuing statements and pressuring the international community, Malaysia had also rendered humanitarian assistance since the beginning of the Rohingya crisis. Indeed, Malaysia had sent humanitarian aid relief for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. On September 9, 2017, October 7, 2017, uh, October 22, 2017, and January 27, 2018, uh, respectively, totaling to 110 107 tons of foodstuff, medicine, and toiletries. To further strengthen our assistance, the Malaysian cabinet on, on September 20th, 2017, had agreed on the establishment of a field hospital in Cox Bazaar, Bangladesh. The Malaysian field hospital has been fully operational since December 1st, 2017. Yes, it was Malaysia who first operated the field hospital in Cox Bazaar when the whole world was still hesitated to act. During uh, its more than three year duration in Kok Bazaar, the Malaysian Field Hospital has gained recognition for its work among in, from the international organizations, including uh, the World uh, Health Organization, NGOs, and also local community. As a result, several countries, including Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Brunei, also made contribution to this particular hospitals operation. Following the COVID-19 pandemic in Bangladesh, the Malaysian Field Hospital temporarily ceased this operation on March 25, 2020. By then, the Malaysian Field Hospital already was managed by 55 Malaysian and 10 Bangladeshi staff, and they have treated around 100 8,000, more than 108,000 patients with an average of almost 300 cases a day. Malaysia subsequently taking this collaboration on, on humanitarian assistance for the Rohingyas to the next level 
by handing over the whole Malaysian field hospital complex and also the medical equipment, level one equipment, with an estimated value of more than USD 2 million to the government of Bangladesh on 14 March 2021 in a historic ceremony that I presided. It was formalized by the signing of a friendship plaque. This handing over, therefore, signifies Malaysia continuous commitment and solidarity with Bangladesh in addressing the Rohingya crisis. May I therefore sum up by reiterating that I have elaborated in great lengths about Malaysia's foreign policies and its bilateral relations with Bangladesh. This relation, which is based on a strong foundation of trust and mutual respect, has stood the test of time for 50 years. I have also touched on a sample of areas of collaboration, but in a way that it degraded others, which I was not able to elaborate here. What is even more important for both countries to enhance the bilateral relation on areas such as trade and investment, which may determine the direction of the relation in the next decade or so. In this regard, again, it is my hope that the FTA will be concluded between Malaysia and Bangladesh. This proposed FTA has also been emphasized by both foreign ministers of Bangladesh and Malaysia during their phone conversation on January 27, 2022, as we celebrated the golden jubilee of diplomatic ties. My foreign minister even expressed our intention to elevate our relationship to a strategic level so that uh, there are also areas such as FTA and also digi digital economy that could be enhanced. Finally, let me emphasize that Malaysia has always been the true friend of Bangladesh as a friend indeed, a friend indeed is a friend indeed, even when the, the whole world was still hesitated to do so. Thanks again uh, for having me here. Long live Malaysia-Bangladesh relations. Terima kasih once again. Uh, thank you and donabat. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Thank you very much um, for that uh, very elaborate and comprehensive uh, presentation. It's highly appreciated. It re reflects your very deep and abide, uh, abiding commitment to your responsibilities and also, also Malaysia's wise and prudent uh, policies, both bilaterally and within the region. I will now give the floor to the discussants one by one for their 10 minute presentations. And I will begin with uh, Ambassador Farooq Soban, as you all know, a very distinguished, uh, uh, remarkably distinguished. Uh, uh, diplomat has been also, apart from other things, Foreign Secretary, uh, also High Commissioner to uh, Malaysia, a country with which, as you have just heard, he continues to retain very close linkages. Ambassador Farooq Subhan, yes, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like, uh, of course, to begin by thanking uh, Cosmos Foundation for taking this initiative to organize this uh, discussion where we have the pleasure of listening to Her Excellency, uh, the Malaysian High Commissioner. Uh, High Commissioner, uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate you and, and thank you for your uh, excellent uh, presentation, uh, focusing on uh, the successful uh, development of our bilateral relations and highlighting uh, some of the key areas where uh, Bangladesh and Malaysia have, have worked closely together. Uh, it was my privilege uh, to have served as uh, High Commissioner in uh, Malaysia from 1984 to 87. Uh, since then, uh, during the uh, roughly uh, 30 uh, five years or so, uh, I think I have visited Malaysia at least 20 times, possibly more. So I have been a regular visitor. And uh, in the process, I have seen the, uh, the remarkable progress uh, that uh, Malaysia has made uh, uh, during successive uh, governments. Uh, uh, the Malaysian relationship, uh, of course, uh, Bangladesh has a number of important features, while uh, certainly uh, uh, 
uh, the issue of our uh, uh, manpower in Malaysia has been a, a centerpiece of the relationship uh, for the last uh, three decades. In fact, uh, I would like to recall that this process began uh, during the period that I was High Commissioner in, in Malaysia. Uh, to be precise, uh, it, uh, followed an understanding uh, with the government uh, in 1985, and I believe the first group of workers came across in 1986. Uh, but uh, I have always uh, been, uh, from the time I was in, in Malaysia, a believer in uh, forging a very special relationship uh, between our two countries. Uh, we have uh, a great many issues uh, that bring us together. And uh, Her Excellency, the High Commissioner, certainly uh, underscored a number of these issues uh, we have traditionally worked very closely together at uh, various multilateral fora. Uh, we have, uh, as the High Commissioner mentioned, uh, worked closely uh, together uh, in organizations uh, such as the Commonwealth, the Non-Aligned Movement, uh, the OIC, uh, and more recently, the D8, uh, uh, where uh, uh, we have, uh, along with uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, really uh, had a similarity of approaches and views on uh, taking D8 forward. But let me also identify three other areas uh, where we have worked very closely together. South-South uh, uh, cooperation, where... Um, Tun Dr. Mahathir uh, played a pioneering role uh, when uh, he uh, was really uh, the person who took the initiative to establish uh, the South Commission, uh, which eventually led to the birth of uh, uh, the South Center. And many initiatives flowed uh, from uh, the work of the South Commission. Uh, it was my pleasure at that time to have worked very closely uh, with uh, Tun Dr. Mahathir, who was uh, the Prime Minister of Malaysia. Uh, another area where uh, we have again worked very closely with Malaysia has been uh, in the case of the World uh, Islamic uh, Economic Forum. Uh, here again, uh, I've had the privilege of uh, working uh, very closely with Tun uh, Musa Hitam. Uh, that has uh, again been uh, a key area uh, of uh, our collaboration and Bangladesh has from the very inception uh, taken a keen interest. I still recall uh, the participation and, and visit of our Prime Minister uh, when uh, Malaysia hosted uh, the World Islamic Economic Forum in Kuala Lumpur in 2010. I, I was privileged to be present also on that occasion. Uh, we have also learned uh, from Malaysia's uh, very active diplomacy in, in Africa, where Malaysia has been one of the lead investors in as many as 14 African countries. Uh, through its uh, Smart Partnership uh, Initiative, uh, which I would like to, to applaud. Uh, uh, I still recall that one of the very important initiatives which uh, was taken uh, by uh, Dr. Mahathir as Prime Minister uh, was um, in uh, stressing uh, two Malaysian investors uh, that they should uh, uh, focus on uh, building investments, uh, uh, Malaysian investments in Bangladesh. And uh, I'm happy to see that uh, thanks to uh, the initiative of, uh, taken by uh, Tun, uh, Dr. Mahathir, uh, Malaysian investments uh, have uh, moved forward. Perhaps uh, more could 
be done in, in the coming uh, months uh, and years. Uh, but uh, I would, uh, apart from uh, the uh, invest, major investment in uh, telecommunications, Malaysia has also been an active investor in, in the power sector. Uh, I was, uh, I'd, I'd like to recall uh, the investments uh, made uh, through a Malaysian company, PowerTech, in uh, Magna Ghat and, and Haripur, two of the major uh, uh, power uh, plants uh, in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, we have also seen uh, a lot of collaboration uh, in uh, the palm oil sector uh, between our countries. Uh, there has also been collaboration in the automobile industry through uh, collaboration in the assembly of proton sagas. And uh, we believe that uh, there are many such more opportunities. Uh, I could identify several more sectors where I believe uh, an excellent uh, opportunity exists. Uh, uh, I'd like to recall uh, the recent uh, visit of uh, uh, Excellency, the uh, Malaysian Minister of Plantation Industries. Uh, uh, during that, uh, the visit of the minister, she uh, had a very uh, productive meeting with uh, our Prime Minister, uh, whilst, uh, uh, of course, uh, both uh, sides agreed to uh, intensify the collaboration uh, in uh, the manpower sector. Uh, we also uh, stressed the importance of building our relations in the area of trade and investment. Uh, we certainly, uh, and, and my uh, institute, uh, the Bangladesh Enterprise Institute, has done work on uh, uh, the issue of uh, Malaysia-Bangladesh uh, free trade agreement. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, been strong advocates, uh, both of uh, not only building our relations with Malaysia, but with ASEAN as a whole, uh, I think Bangladesh needs to focus much more on its uh, Look East policy. And the centerpiece of this Look East policy, in my view, uh, is our relations with uh, ASEAN in, in particular. Uh, within that context, I think Bangladesh not only should be looking at uh, uh, concluding uh, free trade agreements with uh, uh, Malaysia and other ASEAN member states, uh, but also uh, uh, preparing the ground uh, for membership of uh, RESEP, uh, which we believe uh, will play a major uh, role uh, uh, in the coming years. Uh, I'd like to uh, also stress that uh, we have seen uh, a regular exchange of high-level visits and, um, and I would like to recall that among the high-level visits, uh, uh, which were of very great importance to Bangladesh, were the visits uh, uh, that were made uh, at the highest level. Uh, uh, we have uh, had the pleasure of uh, receiving uh, Dr. Mahathir uh, on more than one occasion in, in uh, Bangladesh, and of course, our Prime Minister has been a regular visitor over the years uh, to Malaysia. Uh, we hope these uh, high-level visits uh, will uh, continue. I'd like to conclude with uh, just three or four thoughts on uh, uh, how uh, we may uh, further expand and, and strengthen our relations. Uh, of course, uh, one very important requirement in my view uh, is that uh, we need to be obviously on the same page uh, and working very closely together uh, on the issue of our manpower exports. Uh, the need to do this within a government to government arrangement, uh, uh, free of any, um, uh, let's say, uh, problems which we may have faced in the past. I think that's 
clearly an, an important requirement. Um, I think uh, the need for regular bilateral consultations uh, between uh, uh, the fund ministries of the two countries is extremely important. Uh, Her Excellency, the High Commissioner, made a reference to people-to-people contacts. Uh, uh, I'm happy to say that until uh, the COVID pandemic uh, took place, uh, Malaysia had become a very popular destination uh, for uh, tourism, for for Bangladeshis, uh, and also for for medical tourism, uh, uh, whereas previously the premier destination used to be uh, Bangkok and uh, Singapore. Uh, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, Malaysia now too is uh, seen as uh, a very uh, important uh, destination uh, for many Bangladeshis. Uh, I think Malaysia's uh, second home program also uh, attracted a lot of interest. Uh, My understanding is that uh, uh, there are many Bangladeshis who have now participated in this. Uh, uh, people-to-people contacts, uh, I think, are extremely important. Uh, we have also, uh, I believe, uh, several important uh, areas of collaboration in the field of education. Uh, when I was in High Commissioner, uh, the... Uh, There was a large number of Bangladeshi teachers in in Malaysia and correspondingly there were a large number of uh, Malaysian students uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, uh, Today uh, we have a large number of Bangladeshi students in in Malaysia and we hope uh, we can see a further increase in in the number of uh, our students there. Uh, I think the technical cooperation under the Malaysian Technical Cooperation Program has been uh, extremely important in the bilateral relationship. Uh, And we would also like uh, to see a further expansion in the cultural exchanges uh, that have taken place. I myself have been involved in a number of initiatives on the cultural front, and I see that as very important in the people-to-people relationship. To sum up, uh, I would like to say that, uh, in my view, uh, Malaysia is, uh, for me, certainly, and I hope for the government and for both our countries, uh, one of the most important relationships uh, that Bangladesh has today. Uh, uh, I hope we can further build on the solid foundation that has already been laid over the last 50 years in our bilateral relationship that we can expand and and, uh, learn more from each other. Uh, I'm also very hopeful that we will see uh, a continuation of the high-level visits. Uh, I'd like to conclude uh, by thanking uh, Malaysia for its uh, strong support on the Rohingya issue, which we value greatly, uh, both bilaterally and uh, within the framework of ASEAN. Malaysia has been... uh, a very strong supporter, which uh, uh, counts for a great deal for Bangladesh. Uh, I'd also like to to say that uh, we look forward uh, to working again, uh, continue to work very closely with Malaysia in uh, in the multilateral fora. Uh, And uh, finally, I'd like uh, uh, to wish Malaysia uh, continuing success uh, uh, in the years uh, ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Soban, for your very extensive and very elaborate exposition of uh, Bangladesh-Malaysia relations. Mm-hmm. And also you have touched upon the historical backdrop and much of what you have suggested for the future, you know, the deepening of uh, relationship, uh, both bilateral, economic, uh, across the RCP, you mentioned, uh, and also uh, in terms of exchange, technical cooperation, cultural, etc., in addition to what is generally discussed, uh, very uh, well taken, and I'm sure the uh, policy authorities thought they will pay adequate, uh, adequate attention to those proposals. I'm very pleased to be able to say that now we have a, a, a representative from a very, very 
uh, illustrious uh, institution, a think tank in, in Kuala Lumpur. I had something, uh, uh, quite a good bit to do with, the, with her institute. Uh, Yanita, uh, Yanita uh, Mina, uh, welcome. And uh, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaudhary. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate being here. Um, thank you so much to uh, Her, Her Excellency uh, Puan Hazana and also uh, Ambassador Soban for setting the tone of the discussion. Um, I'd like to thank Cosmos uh, Foundation as well for this invitation. I'm, I'm so privileged to be part of this uh, really stellar panel. Uh, before I start uh, my remarks, I'd like to wish uh, our friends and colleagues from Bangladesh a very happy 51st Independence Day, which we celebrated a few days ago. Uh, this is a very special year for Malaysia-Bangladesh relations, as if we've already heard before. Um, uh, as we're celebrating our Golden Jubilee, I'm very happy to be part of this timely discussion uh, on the future trajectory of our uh, bilateral relations. Um, my initial remarks uh, will broadly focus on three main points, um, which I will uh, briefly elaborate upon uh, in the interest of time. And I look forward to the deliberations and the question answers that we will be taking later. Um, so my first point basically is uh, we've talked a lot about the labor relations, uh, um, you know, that Malaysia and, uh, and Bangladesh share. And my first point is basically that we need to not only enhance, but also move beyond this labor relations tag that we have with our relationship. Um, so I'm sure all of us remember that last year in December, on December 19th, a five-year Malaysia-Bangladesh uh, labor recruitment agreement was signed, and uh, this is after uh, this was after a three-year moratorium on the recruitment of uh, uh, workers from Bangladesh. Um, while this was, you know, it was it was highly welcome. It was a uh, good. It, it was the right step, uh, you know, uh, for for our relations. This does not come without challenges, as we've seen that there are several challenges to actually, you know, address when we when we come to our labor relations. Um, so when we talk about uh, the number of conditions that we need to be looked into, especially with the uh, the case of uh, recruitment agencies and also middlemen, which is uh, you know which forms a bulk of the problem when it comes to uh, these relations. And also, I'd like to add that the pandemic basically exposed uh, several shortcomings uh, in Malaysia's uh, um, relations with. Um, uh, several South Asian countries uh, and also Southeast Asian countries, uh, particularly with the condition of uh, workers and also border and travel restrictions and also repatriation and recalibration of uh, undocumented foreign workers. So this was uh, quite a bit of a challenge when, that we you know, faced since 2020. So for Putrajaya and Dhaka, I, I believe the priority is to address these challenges within the existing MOU. And there must be perhaps structural and functional uh, changes to be made to these, uh, uh, to these labor relations that ensure that these new conditions are impervious to future flux situations. Um, so, you know, I, in my head, I envision a kind of uh, a contingency plan, which is, uh, which is, you know, worked through this uh, Malaysia-Bangladesh relations, because I think this relation is in the forefront of, of what we should do when it comes to uh, migrate, uh, labor migration and the like. And I also believe that, you know, in its enduring and somewhat uh, stereotypical relationship with Dhaka, it is possible that Putrajaya has not fully capitalized on um, the various other vistas of cooperation uh, with Bangladesh. Um, in Malaysia, labor mobility has dominated the discourse uh, on relations with Dhaka. And so much that the view of Dhaka has, you know, it may not be, it, it may not reflect current realities. So as we know, uh, Bangladesh has made great strides in the past decade or so. It's uh, one of the fastest growing economies. It is. Uh, it recently graduated from a uh, least developed country to developing country. So these are, you know, big changes that, that we need to acknowledge here in Malaysia. And so Bangladesh's growing prominence in the region presents a very you know, timely opportunity for Malaysia to diversify its relations with Dhaka and possibly facilitate greater involvement with ASEAN. Which brings me to my next point, um, which... Um, We've talked a lot about uh, the Rohingya crisis, which is a current crisis, uh, um, and it is, um, you know, with, which comes with a lot of challenges. And uh, this exacerbated more, especially after the takeover of the Tatmadaw back uh, in February. I'm sure we all remember. So the Putrajaya Dhaka relationship could be ASEAN's answer to the Rohingya crisis. And while this is not operationalized as of yet, I believe that it is the way to go and the next step, basically, when we want to talk about um, Myanmar and, and, and also the Rohingya crisis as well. So Malaysia and Bangladesh shared 
uh, challenges vis-a-vis -vis the Rohingya crisis demands that Putrajaya and Dhaka develop a more structured and holistic roadmap uh, to manage the refugee issue and thereby be better equipped to garner international recognition um, in the long run. So uh, Malaysia's position as an ASEAN member state and also Bangladesh being the most prominent Rohingya host country will further legitimize such uh, you know, a partnership in the eyes of the international community, I believe. Um, so, and this could in my opinion, be facilitated either through Dhaka's membership in the ARF, the ASEAN Regional Forum, or even through new efforts at making Dhaka a more prominent partner for ASEAN. So early this year, Bangladesh has already indicated that it wants to be um, ASEAN's sec sectoral dialogue partner, which is obviously the, the, the obvious next step uh, in, this, in this current uh, scenario. Um, and also making it clear that policymakers in Dhaka recognize the value at enhanced relations with ASEAN. And um, what's important in my head is that Putrajaya's endorsement of Dhaka as an important partner to ASEAN could create traction for, you know, a sort of minilateral arrangement with key stakeholders in ASEAN, uh, along with ASEAN dialogue partners and also Bangladesh to address specific challenges that have to do with repatriation. Uh, of Rohingya refugees, which obviously we know stalled back, uh, you know, after the Tatmadaw took over, and also extend humanitarian support, you know, things that uh, Bangladesh and Malaysia are known for as in this current uh, situation. And all this, of course, in line with the five point consensus, uh, you know, uh, the five point consensus is something that uh, was, you know, was mooted by uh, the ASEAN leaders last year. But obviously, uh, since, you know, it's, it's almost a year now, and um, we don't see that much of movement in it. So I believe uh, Bangladesh could be the answer for that, in, at least in terms of uh, managing the, the Rohingya crisis uh, and the humanitarian crisis as well. So um, when we talk about um, the relationship of, of Malaysia and Bangladesh, we obviously talk about the, the, their membership in, in, in common multilateral frameworks. Uh, this is, of course, uh, we've, we've already mentioned the D8 and also the OIC. And so with like-minded countries and principles, uh, with principles, objectives and challenges, challenges that align with each other, as we've seen. Um, I believe that Malaysia and Bangladesh should capitalize on the inherent synergy and have a more prominent voice within the within multilateral frameworks such as the D8 and OIC. So um, I'm sure, you know, recent geopolitical events, um, such as I'm sure all of us um, is still fresh in our minds. Uh, the Taliban takeover of, of Afghanistan uh, shows how similar Putrajaya and Dhaka's approach is to the situation, especially in aspects of how uh, you know her humanitarian aid is is pivotal uh, right now to to at least manage the situation. And um, it is it, and it is important that this partnership features prominently uh, as the voice of the OIC ESA or the OIC East and South Asian uh, countries among these countries, of course. Um, especially with the pragmatism, moderation and commitment to an independent foreign policy uh, that Putrajaya and Dhaka are of course known for, as, as we've seen. And so I believe that both our countries uh, are actually strategically placed as uh, to have a more prominent voice within this multilateral frameworks as well. And not only that, play a more leadership position even within the D8, I believe. Um, so as we mark um, 50 years of uh, Malaysia-Bangladesh relations, I believe that it is absolutely imperative that um, both countries internalize this importance of diversifying uh, ties and not just stick to older narratives on, on what you know, defines our relationship. I think we definitely can move beyond that and really work towards, you know, towards lasting steps to, to actually um, um, approach, I mean, to you know, try and solve these shared challenges uh, that we have and, and, and find new approaches to these challenges as well through this relationship. Um, and I especially reiterate this partnership specifically to ASEAN and, and, and the ongoing Rohingya crisis. Um, before I end my, uh, my remarks there, I'm, I'm actually reminded of um, the father of the nation of uh, Bangladesh, uh, Banga Bandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and his vision on, on actually how uh, independent foreign policy is very important. And, uh, and I especially love his moniker, which says, uh, you know, friend of Bengal. So I'd like to reiterate here that Malaysia remains a friend of Bengal uh, no matter what. And I believe the next 50 years uh, should be a testament to this. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Yanika, very well spoken. Uh, the three points uh, uh, that you make uh, are very well taken as well uh, with regard to the need, and that's your thesis, the need to diversify the relationship, go beyond the old narratives. Of course, work on them, enhance uh, uh, labor relations, for instance, but uh, also work, work to spread to across a broader spectrum. Uh, secondly, with regard to the, to the Rohingyas, yes, uh, we're all aware of what Malaysia is doing, and there is need to sort of uh, make a, a build our relationship into some kind of a structural paradigm uh, 
uh, so that it can be fitted into the five-point ASEAN consensus, which is, of course, for, for the wider uh, 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 Myanmar issue. But this could also be fitted into that. Uh, uh, that was the idea of Malaysia playing such a role as fitting these into talking points of, say, the special envoy like the, the, uh, the foreign minister of Cambodia who's just concluded a visit to, to Myanmar. And thirdly, of course, uh, working uh, uh, within the multilateral fora, very important nowadays because uh, all, all multilateralism uh, of, of smaller uh, uh, memberships within the global community is being challenged by uh, superior powers in the field. And there is a, a, a preponderant need for us, uh, what we call the middling powers, to work together to ensure that we have the right kind of uh, playing field for our uh, interactions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next on my uh, on my on my list is uh, Professor Imtiaz Ahmed, uh, uh, an old face, and, and of course in ISIS as well, in all the regional fora, and uh, also in in, in Cosmos. Is, uh, his uh, uh, institute is doing tremendous work on genocide, and I believe would have received a, a additional spur. By, by some re recent developments, and I show it to respond adequately to that. Intiaz, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Iftar uh, Your Excellency enjoyed your uh, presentation, uh, very detailed. And I don't want to uh, report, uh, you know, repeat what uh, Farag Bhai and, uh, and Yanka has already flagged. A uh, couple of things that I just want to point out to uh, take things uh, a little bit uh, ahead, not necessarily that uh, um, you have to do it tomorrow, but uh, uh, let me flag some of the things. Uh, since we have been talking on the Rohingya, and since we know that uh, there are Rohingyas in Malaysia, uh, as well as in, in Bangladesh, uh, my uh, research tells me uh, altogether there are 19 countries uh, where we have Rohingya diaspora. Uh, I think it's high time uh, that uh, this Rohingya diaspora be brought into a collective uh, kind of a you know entity uh, and Malaysia can really work on this uh, it's a civil entity uh, when we talk about Rohingyas there is no civil entity you know uh, time and again we talk uh, you know moment the Rohingya comes uh, immediately the word Arsa comes and then things go in a different direction uh, it is high time that they should have a civil entity and they should actually go around the world uh, to uh, claim their case uh, you know, Bangladesh, Malaysia, we can help, but uh, uh, unless the Rohingyas themselves, uh, they don't do it, uh, it's not going to take, uh, you know, the issues uh, far away. And, and uh, Myanmar military would always, you know, have uh, uh, different issues. And of course, Malaysia would have its own interest, Bangladesh would have its own interest. So I think here Malaysia can uh, play a role. Uh, and there's a good number of uh, uh, Rohingya uh, scholars and, and individuals in Malaysia. Uh, I know them, uh, uh, some of them, uh, but there are also spread around. So uh, a civil entity um, of, 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 of the Rohingyas uh, could be something uh, if Malaysia, uh, I guess, takes it up. Uh, I believe uh, Bangladesh should also be very happy to join uh, uh, on, on a program uh, uh, where, where the Rohingyas would benefit uh, ultimately. Uh, number two on the Rohingya issue, now that the sanction diplomacy has come back, uh, the West was a little bit allergic on the sanction diplomacy. Uh, they were telling us all through, uh, I remember in series of meetings, uh, telling me, no, Prof, sanction doesn't work. Uh, but now the sanctions have come back <laughs> for whatever reasons. And we can, uh, we can blame uh, Ukraine or Putin for that, but the sanctions have come back. And so I think it's time again that... Uh, uh, we look into the sanction diplomacy and, and see where uh, uh, we can make a difference. Yes, the United States uh, has, uh, you know, flagged this idea that, uh, uh, that a genocide has taken place uh, in uh, Malaysia, sorry, in, in Myanmar. But the point here is uh, how, how far the United States would, would go. Uh, that still remains a, a question. But I think we, we should not wait for the United States uh, some of the countries, because there's quite credible evidence that this time there has been uh, some genocide. If you, even if you take the provisional uh, judgment uh, at the ICJ, it's quite clear something has, uh, has, has gone wrong with its crime against humanity or, or genocide. So uh, we don't have to wait for the final verdict to come. Uh, I think in between 
now when the final verdict uh, uh, if we can start working uh, maybe uh, we can make difference uh, to the lives uh, of the rohingyas question uh, the second point that i want to uh, flag and 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 you have rightly pointed out that pandemic is 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 a critical one and i have always wondered that why do we wait uh, for vaccines to come from some other countries why can't uh, bangladesh malaysia together why can't we produce vaccine or why can't we start working on it uh, why two or three countries can't join together and and make vaccines why do we have to wait for a particular country or a particular company to do that uh, it's not rocket science anymore uh, once you have it first time it's a rocket science but the second time a uh, third time is not a rocket science uh, now series of you know, several countries have already made vaccine waiting for vaccines to come and and spending all the money because uh, this is not going to go away virus will mutate yes maybe covid 19 but then there will be a covid 20 or covid 21 there will be you know virus mutate that's that's normal uh, and it has nothing to do with one particular uh, area uh, you know that's uh, doesn't make any sense any little knowledge of science would tell you that doesn't make any sense virus would mutate in different places back in 1900 you know uh, or back when we had the spanish uh, flu uh, there was no civil aviation uh, but the but the spanish flu were everywhere even australia had spanish flu so it, it's not like it, it went by ship uh, so the, the virus would mutate in 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 many places as humans would mutate we take millions of years to mutate uh, we had tails don't forget at uh, one for a time uh, but that tail is not there uh, i would love to have the tail actually but uh, somehow it got mutated and, and and got lost but the point here is uh, millions of years it takes for humans to mutate but virus mutates uh, very fast so i think the if if we have to take in lesson from the pandemic is how countries can cooperate not how uh, countries can you know become singular and and end up with vaccine nationalism because vaccine nationalism is not going to help you in, in the next pandemic at all uh, you can you can make some money out of it uh, but it doesn't make uh, sense when uh, thousands of people get killed uh, i guess united states would be a good example uh, the number of people that got killed in the united states they could have actually made a difference uh, if uh, they had some attention uh, to what public health measures you know what public health is all about uh, and and not make into Uh, a kind of uh, uh, politics and 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 not uh, end up with insular politics or politics of singularity so this is the other area i think uh, malaysia and bangladesh can start thinking about uh, how they can collaborate uh, in in the vaccine production and in the pharmaceutical area much in a much deeper way uh, so that in the future whenever uh, something happens uh the two countries uh, uh, particularly the scholars of two countries the scientists of two countries can get together so there should be an institutional framework uh, uh made uh, already and and i'll i'll come with this idea uh, and i'm let me float it again and this is my third point uh is you know you can focus on trade uh, and business but that will not take you very far it doesn't uh, unless the mindset changes and this is where the education uh, comes the, the education has an important role to play i am uh, i am involved with one of the private universities of malaysia uh, i am a visiting professor of taylor's university and 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 we work very closely on many things and my experience tells me uh, that there's so much to do actually uh, between these two countries on, on different areas uh, so that we have a far productive mindset on different areas from science from business from culture from performance arts and i can go on and on so to do that and keeping the pandemic in mind i think it's high time that we uh, float uh, something called bangladesh malaysia foundation there is uh, we have something like india bangladesh foundation uh, i'm sure uh, ambassador farooq sawan and ambassador etaka choudhury are aware of that um, uh, it has done some good work uh, i think if we can bring uh, if we can have something like bangladesh Malaysia Foundation, uh, and it can be you know public-private partnership. Also, we can invite uh, some private uh, entrepreneur as well uh, in the foundation, and from that foundation we can start uh, uh, introducing fellowship of different you know junior fellowship, senior fellowship, uh, short-term fellowship, long-term fellowship on different issues, on issues of science, on issues of management, on on business, uh, even uh, helping the workers. 
you know, how to protect, you know, how to go about, you know, all those things. Uh, that I think is, is, is important. And this brings me to the, uh, to the point of uh, investing on the youth. Uh, if we start investing on the youth from now, uh, believe it or not, you know, 10, 20 years from now, uh, those youth would make a difference. Uh, myself, I've come up with, you know, way back in, you know, interacting with South Asians on different fellowship programs. And some of my friends are in, in, in absolutely in extraordinary, uh, in important places. So I don't read newspaper actually, <laughs> you know, I, I just call them up, uh, you know, whether it's China or, or in India or in Pakistan, I, I, I never read newspaper and or media information because media has its own politics. I just call them up uh, and, 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 and there are several places, they're all spread in different places or, or even in the United States, a good number of American friends who are in high position and can give a far better information as to what is happening. So I think that uh, critical mass uh, can be established if we have a foundation uh, of a kind and, and uh, promote it uh, in a way in, in different areas, uh, we can uh, make a difference. My, my last two points uh, would be uh, on the issue uh, of, of tolerance and, and, and Islam. Uh, we are familiar with this idea that uh, you know, the intolerance has crept in uh, in the Islamic domain and, and Malaysia is, is a champion when, when you know, in, uh, reproducing tolerant version of Islam. Uh, I think it's, it's important uh, for uh, you know, a, a serious research uh, uh, agenda, both Malaysia and, and uh, Bangladesh, and of course, one can bring other countries as well, uh, to create a, a, a pedagogy of tolerance, let's put it that way, uh, to share uh, knowledge on, on, on Islam, uh, which would make a difference and uh, not get sucked into uh, the rigid version that we have. And it is not only Islam, you, know, you have that same thing in Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity, all ended up what I say is singularity uh, or politics of singularity, uh, all, the, all, the, all the religions. Malaysia and Bangladesh can actually play an important role. Uh, my center works very, uh, you know, uh, with Indonesian uh, Habibi Center uh, on this, uh, on, on this issue of, of how we can create a kind of a tolerant uh, pedagogy. I, I think it's important uh, that Malaysia can uh, come in and if uh, the High Commission takes a step, uh, it becomes easy for many other universities and, uh, uh, you know, uh, scholars to, to get into that. And, and, the, and the final point from there is the issue of violent extremism. Uh, we can't be complacent on, on the current situation. Yes, relatively, I, I would say uh, we are better uh, placed, but uh, one case can uh, make uh, things go down. Uh, we have seen what has happened in New Zealand, for example. Nobody thought uh, that New Zealand uh, would get hit, uh, but one person uh, made a, quite a difference to what New Zealand is all about. Same thing happened after 10 years in Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka 10 years was fine, and then one, you know, one bang, and, and, and there you go. Uh, I think on the issue of violent extremism also, and if you can build the tolerance, uh, the critical mass that uh, I'm, I'm referring to, uh, uh, I believe uh, Malaysia and Bangladesh can make a difference uh, to many other countries uh, in the world, because all are suffering uh, in, in one way or other uh, from, uh, from these issues. So, my hope lies uh, with uh, the, the civilization linkages that Malaysia and, and Bengal had or South Asia had. Uh, you know, uh, these are, you know, uh, old civilizations and, and they have been part of very old civilizations. Uh, I, I remember one uh, particular webinar that we did with Taylor's University on the civilizational linkages. Mm -hmm. And I myself was amazed, uh, you know, scholars from Malaysia speaking on the civilization linkages and also scholars from South Asia. Uh, it, it, it was such vibrant on, on different issues and, and how things got, uh, you know, connected. Uh, but somehow, you know, uh, during the colonial times, a uh, lot of things got uh, uh, distorted and, 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 and also got erased. So it's time to work on those things so we can uh, reestablish the linkages uh, in, in different uh, areas. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Amtiaz. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very, very good points. Uh, uh, the one with uh, regard to uh, the formation of a collective entity, as you say, of the of the Rohingyas. You are probably thinking in terms of some kind of a CSO, civil society organization, 
Yes, that is very, that would be very appropriate. In fact, the resistance in Malaysia, in, in Myanmar has already an entity of its own, but that's, that's really government. One didn't go that far, but to set up a CSO, this could be done by directly uh, connecting uh, bilaterally with, with, uh, with, with the Rohingyas. No need perhaps to, to, to go through the ASEAN because there you would need a, some kind of a consensus within the ASEAN framework. Your, your sec, the, the idea of that one need not wait for the verdict on genocide because there has obviously been ethnic cleansing, there has been uh, crimes against humanity, there have been war crimes. So actually these are the four horsemen of apocalypse that should trigger the responsibility to protect resolutions. So I think the time has come to work seriously on, on, on this aspect. And thirdly, the idea of a Malaysia Bangladesh Foundation. The other things that you, you mentioned, this tolerance, yeah, the, the uh, infusion of syncretism in, in the practice of, of religion and the avoidance of, of, of violent extremism. And these are ideas that can be discussed within the foundation framework, I think. So very good, thank you very much. Next, I would turn to Professor uh, uh, Titumir. Uh, he has been uh, uh, contributing to the intellectual consciousness, as, as if it were, of Cosmos Foundation uh, through several seminars. Uh, we have looked to him to ideas and we have not been disappointed. So we do that once again. Uh, Titumir, the floor is yours uh, as the final, but not but, uh, the least speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Choudhury. Thank you, Cosmos Foundation, for inviting me to say a few words. As we all know, being the last speaker, I learned more, and I have to speak less, as the most issues were covered. Through the High Commissioner, let us felicitate the people of Malaysia, as this year marks the Golden Jubilee celebration of Malaysia-Bangladesh relations. I couldn't agree more with fellow panelists underscoring that Malaysia can play an instrumental role to help solve Rohingya crisis. And rightly, Malaysia is the largest market for Bangladeshi workers in Southeast Asia. And the signing of the MOU last year was a relief after months of preparations and consultations, ending the moratorium on the recruitment imposed back in September 2018. Yet, as has been said, many pressing issues remain unanswered. However, we all seek transparent, fair and safe migration that complies with the provisions of the international labor organization. It is nevertheless important that we move for, towards a forward-looking journey, which has to be built on beyond labor and Rohingya to that of a strategic partnership. In this connection, I'll make some observation. The issue of FTA has been highlighted. I would like to emphasize on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP. And this is, there is, this is currently the largest trade agreement in the world. Bangladesh has GSP st status as a least developed country. Bangladesh has a total of 14 free trade agreements, including APTA and SAFTA. By 2026, Bangladesh will graduate from a least developed country. As a result, Bangladesh will lose a number of benefits from GSP, which will affect the country's overall growth and competitiveness. Currently, most of the Asian economic giants have joined the deal, and it is expected that these growing economies of Asia will dominate the global market in the next decade. Therefore, joining a trade agreement like RCEP, RCEP will be very fruitful for Bangladesh. Malaysia can play a pivotal role beside Bangladesh's further engagement with ASEAN in ARF, the dialogue partnership, what would be more important is both countries be key pivots in OIC D8 through pursuing independent policy. Malaysia continues to be the largest Islamic banking, Sukuk, and Takaful market in ASEAN. 
there are vast opportunities and potential areas of collaboration and innovation in Islamic financial services, such as SOKOK, International Islamic Liquidity Management. Besides innovation, there could be joint research collaboration relating to risk management. Malaysia and Bangladesh being maritime countries, as has been underscored, yet maritime engagement has been limited. What is needed is to cooperate to have a peaceful Bay of Bengal, given the growing tension in the Indo-Pacific region. So re-establishing the Himalayan South Asian connectivity has to be emphasized. Malaysia could also think of being a member of the BIMSTEC, Bay of Bang Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. Now I would have my last point. Bangladesh and Malaysia both are striving to become middle income to, to higher income countries. Earlier, Malaysia, Malaysia has demonstrated successful fiscal and monetary policies. For example, by early 1998, it was clear that during the Asian financial crisis, the pro-cyclical IMF macroeconomic policies were not working. The National Economic Recovery Plan was seen as an alternative to orthodox IMF policies. It successfully stabilized the local currency, restored market confidence, maintained financial market stability, restructured corporate debt, recapitalized and restructured the banking sector and, river, uh, and thus revitalized the economy. Now, the country is plogged by what is known as middle income trap. A sustainable solution warrants uh, delving into the root of the crisis. The formation of post-colonial independent states, the punctured institutions, and the contingent political competition for primitive capital accumulation. These have largely been ignored, and the formation of a citizen state has been held back with frequent conflicts. The compulsion of citizenship and the state building warrants to build institutions for citizens. As in both countries, the clientelism molded into a more authoritarian system of exchange where the political settlement comprised of individuals and groups that yielded benefits of affiliation with ruling party, concentrating the power in the hands of the few. So equally worrying is the current political sphere, which is rigged with a trending fallacious debate about a trade-off between democracy and development, whereas every country in history has nurtured their own unique political processes. The ability for rapid transformability and sustainability lies in the need of inclusive equalizing policies that expedite the goals, should I borrow from our Proclamation of Independence in 1971, which says of equality, human dignity, and social justice. Uh, this is what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you for the floor. Uh, thank you, Titimur. Uh, excellent, uh, as, as usual, uh, the point that you make about uh, also taking the uh, multilateral uh, group, uh, route along with the FTA, I mean, the emphasis on the R R R RCEP, your idea that uh, there could be cooperation on Islamic uh, financial uh, uh, systems. And you have touched upon a very critical subject, which is the avoidance of the middle income trap. I mean, this is something that is, uh, it is obviously something that would be, be bedeviling our economy when we, when we uh, after we have graduated. There is much to learn from Malaysia and also from, from other ASEAN uh, uh, countries in this respect. Uh, ultimately, if we are looking to a uh, unique uh, political process of inclusion, as you have uh, concluded by saying, and what we aim to do, I'm sure Malay uh, our relationship with Malaysia will assist us in our journey along and towards that goal. So thank you very much, Dikunir, very, very well done. I will now, uh, uh, High Commissioner, as I have had said earlier, you have heard all the interventions of the discussants. It is possible that you might have some additional points to make yourself or react to some of the points that have been made uh, by, by, by our panel. So for the next few minutes, uh, five, five to seven minutes, High Commissioner, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Chowdhury. 
I wish uh, to respond to some of uh, the points raised, uh, which I truly appreciate uh, to, and I uh, truly grateful to be able to learn to the thoughts uh, that, and issues raised uh, by the panelists. Um, I think it's, it's very clear now that you know, there are, I wish to differentiate in terms of the, the perception and the reality in terms of our relations uh, between the bilateral relation between Malaysia and Bangladesh. Uh, the perceptions, I think, is very much um, uh, heavily depends on the uh, human resource issues. I think that that is the perception of, of the public, uh, both uh, in Malaysia and, and also in Bangladesh which is very important. I acknowledge, uh, recognize the importance of uh, these human resource both not only to Bangladesh, but also to the, Malay to the, to the Malaysian government, to, to Malaysian, to uh, the Malaysian people, not only the Malaysian government. Um, but having said uh, that, um, the, the foundation of our relations uh, between Malaysia and Bangladesh, again, is based on respect and mutual trust. And human resource is just one of the areas of collaborations. And I agreed, I fully agreed that uh, our relations uh, is well, uh, is, is beyond it, uh, beyond human resource. And uh, when we are talking about the strategic uh, relationship, of course, my from uh, my uh, foreign minister has yet to elaborate uh, further on that uh, letter. I think, but we can see that the future areas of collaboration, like I mentioned just now, was uh, FTA uh, that I mentioned, and also uh, like digital economy. Uh, here also we have digital Bangladesh. And of course, the element of education, I agree that is, is fully important, uh, both not only in Malaysia, but also in Bangladesh. But uh, again, uh, there are also areas of collaboration which might not be perceived in the eyes of the public of both in Malaysia and Bangladesh, but always uh, been perhaps not discreetly, but has been there uh, for so long. Uh, for instance, our defense corporations, we are very close, but we will not, I, um, I will not be able to elaborate it here. Uh, Ambassador Subhan, of course, uh, we were well aware about this. So the, these are actually, for 50 years, there has been the foundation all along, just that we don't, uh, it, it has not been perceived. Uh, it always uh, been uh, around the, the human resource issues. Like I said, even though it is very important, but uh, the challenges to both government, because it involves factors beyond us. We are trying very best to control it, uh, to, to uh, handle it with uh, delicately, uh, but again, uh, it involves elements uh, which are beyond our control, but we are trying our best to implement it in the best way that would benefit not only both by government, but the uh, people of both nations. And uh, I also heard about uh, Rohingyas just now. Uh, I think I already spoke at great length about the Rohingyas. Um, just that, I wish to mention here, um, uh, frankly, um, we always... Uh, uh, in support of the Rohingyas, as I uh, elaborated in great details uh, before. But uh, Malaysia is doing this actually, even though we are in a very difficult, uh, we are at a very difficult position. As a member of ASEAN, yes, you could uh, fully capitalize it. But for us, uh, as a member of ASEAN who believe in uh, non interference, uh, and also uh, ASEAN solidarity, uh, we have been trying our best to balance and maneuver these issues because this has also not only uh, international issues to us, it also becoming our domestic issues to be handled delicately by the government of Malaysia. And I'm very frank in, in saying that. 
And uh, just now it was mentioned about the vaccine collaborations. Uh, it was a very good idea. So I think uh, that's very high on my agenda apart from FDA. Uh, pharmaceutical health collaboration is, is very high, like I said, on my agenda. It's something that we should explore. I agree along with other areas of collaboration, collaboration that we should also explore. And uh, it was mentioned about the proposed uh, foundation of the uh, Bangladesh and Malaysia. I appreciate the idea, uh, just that, uh, Professor, with due respect, uh, we have so many uh, organizations already. Uh, we should capitalize whatever we have uh, instead of uh, just adding it. Uh, some more, just like uh, the uh, proposed membership to, to the Bay of Bengal, whatever. I, I think that also we already have uh, the uh, mutual membership like uh, IORA, uh, D8. So I think we should capitalize whatever we have rather than duplicate. And uh, in, in the end, what we want, this the multilateral fora is just a tool for us to achieve the target. In the end, the, the end result, the, what we want to achieve, if the close relations between Malaysia and Bangladesh through this multilateral and uh, bilateral fora. So, uh, and just like MOU, we sign uh, so many MOUs. Uh, actually, uh, I'm sorry, Subhan, we signed uh, the MOU on uh, LNG uh, last year. Uh, so, I, I am really looking forward uh, for the uh, implementation of that MOU, for instance. So uh, it, MOU is important, but in the end, we want the, the actual result, the implementation of this. And again, like I said, these are all the tools, all the uh, platforms. But in the end, what we want is a sustainable relations between Malaysia and Bangladesh for the next decade. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, sustainable relationship with Bangladesh between Bangladesh and Malaysia over the next uh, decade remains very much our goal. We have covered a huge lot of subjects uh, in this discussion, which has been a very, very rich discussion. I wouldn't, I shan't even attempt to uh, uh, sum summarize uh, uh, the points made, but certain key features have naturally stood out, and uh, they, uh, uh, it's probably apt that I mention some some of these. Though we have recorded everything that has been said, and eventually we will produce uh, uh, some kind of an outcome of these deliberations. Uh, labor issues, of course, yes. Uh, the MOU that was signed in two thousand and twenty-one uh, that would need to be implemented. Uh, secondly, of course. Uh, uh, the FDA, I mean, we have to do some serious thinking with regard to FDA, which is a hugely uh, technical subject, of course. There are many, many issues involved with FDA, which covers a very wide spectrum of, of activities. The fact that we are graduating from the LDCs places us in a very important position, uh, as Titi had also mentioned about the need to avoid this middle income trap, etc. So we have to look to all these fine, fine points when we discuss uh, bilateral uh, economic relationship on the question of the Rohingyas. Yes, of course, thank you very much for, for all the support, High Commissioner. We do understand, we do understand, and that is what I was referring to, the intricacies of working within the framework of ASEAN at the same time, having a slightly varied bilateral position on a particular issue. And that, that would require some tightrope walking on your part, but you are doing a very good job at it. The other point was the need for global cooperation across a spectrum of global activities in the world that's happening today. Uh, our contribution, intellectual contribution towards uh, the syncretic thread in our, uh, in our faiths, et cetera, that uh, we practice both in Malaysia in, and Bangladesh. In Malaysia, it's, uh, it's done very well with the help of the rulers and with the federation, et cetera. The rulers have certain responsibilities. The federation has another. So uh, we can le learn from that and we could together work across this spectrum of, uh, of, of multilateral institutions in order to ensure that there is some kind of a rule of law uh, for us to operate in within the region and also on the wider uh, matrix in the globe itself. I will now with these few words uh, conclude the formal uh, part of the, of the deliberations. Thank you very much for all your support. 
Anahar, thank you tremendous for you and your team. As executive director, you've done a tremendous job with putting uh, the entire uh, effort together. We, on behalf of all the participants, I also would like to thank you for it and give you the floor for your final closing remarks. Thank you all very much and thank you, Ambassador. The formal uh, uh, webinar is closed. Thank you, Dr. Iftikhar, and thank you all for this extremely stimulating discussion on Bangladesh-Malaysia relations. I think we can all agree that this has been a very bright for the relationship, so long as the correct initiatives are taken up to guide the bilateral engagements that we have seen span so many spaces. And from what we have learned today, I think we can be confident that the interest, the motivation, and the drive are there on both sides to realize the full potential of our ties. On behalf of the Cosmos Foundation, I would like to express our profound appreciation to High Commissioner Hasna Muhammad Hashim for her brilliant participation. Our distinguished panel of discussants are also owed a special thanks for sharing their thoughts with us, which has been a key factor in the roundtable's success today. Last but not least, praise is also due to our chair, Dr. Chowdhury's skillful stewardship of the proceedings. In conclusion, may we join our hands in applauding this very successful event today. Wishing you all good health and all the best. Uh, there is an another person who merits a mention who, is, who does not appear on the screen today, but he has always been in the background and he has given us tremendous support from, from within and from without. And that is the uh, chair, chairman of the Cosmos Group, Inayatullah Khan who is presently traveling, but uh, he's with us in spirit. And I, I also believe it, uh, he is, has listened into much of what we have said. Thank you so much, Anayat. Thank you for your support. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you, thank you. everyone. Uh, thank you, High Commissioner. Pleasure meeting you, even though yeah. it's virtually. I hope we will have a chance to meet in person. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, to the Cosmos Foundation, represented here by uh, Ms. Han uh, and my fellow panelists. Uh, best wishes to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank Thank you very you. much. Bye, Thank bye, you. everyone. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye.